So we've got a bit of a rainy day here at the Flow Hive office this morning. So we're going to be running through 10 common mistakes that people make when they're getting started in beekeeping. Now, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes. That's how we learn. So don't let anyone intimidate you. And by all means, ask those questions that might seem silly because that's how we learn. So there will be opportunities to answer your questions, questions in the comments below. And we're going to run through the uh, those common mistakes that beekeepers do do when they're getting started. We all started off as new beekeepers once, so don't worry. All you have to do is learn, move on, and that's how you become a, a good beekeeper. And if we look after the bees, then you get that beautiful reward of harvesting honey, which is such a, a magical thing. So number one is Let's say you've got a swarm or you've got a package and you're, you're putting it into your hive and you didn't quite have enough of these frames made up. So you just put some of them in, you put the lid back on and then you forgot about it. In that case, what's going to happen is the bees will fill the empty space. Bees will always fill whatever space they have and they're trying to build it all out so there's about a, a nine millimeter gap between uh, working surfaces so so if you leave a gap the bees will build all of this random comb and what that'll mean is you've got this big mess that's not serviceable it needs to be serviceable you need to be able to pull out these frames from time to time to look in and see how your bees are doing make sure they're happy and healthy so you want to make sure once you've put your swarm or your package in the box or perhaps you started with a nucleus then all of the frames go in, leaving any excess space on these two edges. Push the frames together. There's an important spacing between the frames, so make sure they're squeezed nice and tight together, any excess space on either side. And that way, you'll increase the chances of your bees building nice, straight frames. If you've started with a with naturally drawn comb, this is especially important if you're allowing them to build their natural comb from the comb guide that we supply. Okay, so you can ha see there, courtesy of Hilary Kearney, a nice full frame. So you want to make sure the bees are building it in the frame like that. And that takes us to the next point, which is having your hive level. Now, if your hive is all wonky like this, you haven't bothered to level it, what can happen is the bees will hang their comb down here and gravity will take it off the frame and on to the next one. So if you're drawing, letting the bees build their beautiful natural comb, make sure your hive is level in the sideways direction so your bees can build nice and straight down and not connect their wax right on to the other frame. So if you have a look here on the Flow Hive 2, we have levels inbuilt for you on the side, this is the honey harvesting one. So that uh, is not so important for the naturally drawn comb. The hive can be on a slope in this direction. The forwards to back direction, it can be on a slope and we need it to be on a slope for honey harvesting. However, the sideways direction, and we'll put a level in the ventilated cover at the back here to, to find that level. All you need to do is get that bubble in the middle and you've got level. If you have our classic hive, you'll need to use a conventional level and level the surface before you put your base down. So that's uh, an important one to remember, a simple thing to do and it will help your bees draw nice straight comb. Now number three, and do put your questions, we'll get to them at the end of um, going through some of these points. Number three is you are inspecting your brood box. You've got your smoker, you're in your bee suit, you're pulling out these frames, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing to look in and see what the bees are doing, and you've tilted it over to have a good look, and the comb has fallen out and fallen on the ground. You only do that once because you feel so bad about all of their hard work falling out of the frame. Something to look out for on naturally drawn comb is it's very weak, especially when they're starting out. When they start connecting it 
to the sides and the edges it gets stronger and you can tip it over but at first it's very fragile so if you're using a, a plastic foundation or a wax foundation sheet then you can tip it over but if you're letting them draw the comb themselves don't tilt it like that you want to make sure it's always moving in this axis if you want to swap to the other side you can simply spin it like that or you can go over like that but you're trying not to tilt it on its side okay number four your smoker going out now when you're using your smoker it's typical that um, you forget about it a little bit you're absorbed in the beehive this is wonderful world in here you're looking at and your smoker goes out and when you need it because the bees are starting to get a little bit agitated you don't actually have the smoker going and then you've got to take your gloves off and get your lighter out light up that smoker again and it's a, a typical classic thing that happens in the beginning as you're starting out as you progress you'll learn to just give your smoker a puff every now and then to keep that smoker going keep it ready to go when you need it okay and that takes us to point number five which is hive positioning so bees gps locate to the spot so if you put your hive somewhere and let's say you haven't thought about it too much and you put your hive right where the entrance is flying past where you might need to walk so let's say you face the entrance right here and you need to get past here on a daily basis and you're like why did i put my hive there then you go oh well i'll move it across the yard i'll move it just 10 meters away that won't matter but because bees locate to the exact spot what all the bees will do is they'll they'll go out flying for the day and come back to the old spot because they remember where it was and you end up with a ball of bees over here but your hive over here and uh, and then you'll need to go through this process of moving all of those bees back to the where you've moved your hive or bring the hive back again and slowly stepping it meter by meter across the yard so putting your hive in a position to start with is a good idea thinking about where the flight path is going to go so it doesn't bother anybody and you don't have that situation where bees are randomly flying into guests as they walk down your garden path number six putting your super on too early so it's a wonderful thing to to watch your brood box grow and your bees bees building their comb on the frames and sometimes we can get a little bit impatient and put the super which is the honey collection box on top here and we put it on a bit too early and what that means is your bees will take a while to get going on that super if you're in a warm climate no biggie you can just leave it on there and they'll eventually get to working those frames up here in your flow hive super if it's a cooler climate then you probably want to take it off again because if you have too much space it's just a bit harder for your bees to keep the hive warm and keep that just uh, around body temperature kind of temperature in the brood nest that they need to keep their babies happy and healthy and growing so so uh, make sure if you're in those cooler regions to wait till the bottom box is nice and full you want combs like you can see down here thank you Hillary for these beautiful pictures and you want lots of bees in your box and all the frames nice and drawn out like you can see this frame right here so once the bees have finished all of those frames and you've got lots of bees when you open the window when you open the side window you're seeing lots of bees sorry there's no side window on the, the brood box when you look into the top of the hive you're seeing lots of bees then it's time to put your super on and then your uh, your bees will be far quicker to populate that that super and start uh, waxing it all up and storing nectar in your flow frames next one super on backwards now this is one i see from time to time and i remember this because a friend of mine sent me a pic of their hive and it's a simple thing but they had the super around in this direction so basically the honey harvesting side was the same as the entrance side 
easy thing to do, but what that'll mean is either you're trying to harvest honey and the bees are coming out right here, so you're trying to put your jar here, but the bees are all around it, and it's much easier if you're harvesting honey on the other side of the hive away from the entrance. Also, we've built the slope either into the base of the classic hive or we've designed it so it slopes back this way, so your honey actually won't come out if your box is this way, but the slope is that way and you'll end up flooding your hive with honey. So make sure to put the super so the harvesting side is around away from the entrance. Like that. Okay. The flow frame setup. So the next one is when you go to super your hive. I'm just going to take the, the roof off here and the inner cover off. There's a few things you need to do to set up your flow frames to make them ready for the bees. So I'll show you what to do right here. You'll need to take this cap out and insert the key into the top slot and give that a turn. What that means is all of the cells in that frame are now pushed into the cell formed position ready for the bees to wax that up and start their process of storing honey. If you've just pulled them out of the box and put them in, there's a chance that some of these cells will be in the upways uh, position and the bees won't actually be able to use that area of the frame. So it is a must when you first set up your super, the key goes into the top slot of each frame, turn it to 90, pull it out, and that's all you need to do. Do that to each frame to make sure all the cells in the flow frames are set in the correct position ready for the bees to start working. The next thing is the alignment of these frames. Now this is a common one. There's a step here where you want to push the frames forward so they, they form a nice window at the front. And we've made a little adjustment screw at the back here so you can adjust that out depending on the size of your bee box and what that does is push the frame forward. So you want to make sure all the frames are pushed forward and that way it forms a nice flat window that bees aren't escaping. So if you have a look at that here, it's nice and flat, but if you'd forgotten that step, then what you'd see is something like this. And then when you put the key in and go to turn it, you can even get movement across with bees coming out here. So make sure you, go, you uh, adjust these screws at the back or a little hack if you, you don't have anything to adjust them is just to put a stick or something in the back here to push the frames forward so they form a nice flat window like that. The comb guide can be an excellent piece of material to put in the back there. One of the comb guides from the frames, if you've got a spare one of them sitting around, is about the right size. You can just put that in that area as well. That's a good little tip if you're doing a lot of of beekeeping you don't want to adjust those screws okay keep the questions rolling in we will get to answering them as we go I just want to cover a couple more points number nine in a cover in the wrong place so a thing that I do see out there is people get their brood box set up which is typically like that when you begin you just begin with the brood box in the cover on top and the roof on top of that that gives the bees a smaller home as they're starting out then they come along and perhaps they take their inner cover out or perhaps they don't but they then might do something like this put an excluder there that's the grid that stops the queen getting into your honey storage area so that does need to go in between the two boxes and then the super on top of that. So that's not a very good setup because your bees won't be able to come up into your flow frames to start storing honey. No biggie, if you've done that, all you need to do is take your flow hive super off and take this out. The queen excluder goes on top of your brood box like that. Then your frames, which are all now set up nicely, go right on top of that and that is the correct setup in a cover on top of that 
I like to leave the plug in, but it's up to you. And that will keep the bees in this area instead of up in the roof cavity. Then the roof goes on, on top of that. Okay, now harvesting honey before it's ready. Now you've been looking after your bees, they've, doing, they've been doing well, there's lots of flowers around, they've been bringing in the honey, it's all a bit exciting and you can't wait to turn that key and watch the honey flow right out of your hive. What happens if you turn it a little bit early is the honey might not be quite ready yet and you see it's quite runny in the jar. This is nice and thick in the jar but if it's quite runny in the jar it means that you've harvested it a bit early. The moisture content could be above that 20% range and your honey might not keep in your jar. It'll start to ferment, you'll see little bubbles form and it'll start turning into mead. No biggie, if you notice if your honey is a bit runny in your jar, it just means you need to eat it before it starts to ferment or if you keep it in the fridge, it will last longer that way. So it's not, not a major issue. If you're anything like my family, you'll eat it quite quickly anyway. Questions in the comments below. There's some common things. As said earlier, if you make mistakes as you go, that's how you learn. It's no issue to make mistakes. In fact, if you've made some that you want to share, it'll help other people as they progress in beekeeping. So if you've got mistakes that you'd like to put in the comments below, let people know your experience and how you fix that experience. And that will help others get started. That's what we're all about here on the Facebook live stream is helping everybody get their questions answered so they have success in this wonderful thing of beekeeping. Trace here is going to answer the questions that people are putting in the comments below. You might uh, recognise her voice if you've phoned up the office. Trace is often here answering the phone calls, looking after people, looking after their orders and she also keeps the wheels on around the office here. So we're a very small office at the moment and um, we're keeping our distance <laughs> from each other. So questions yeah thanks Cena. um god there's lots coming in and i've never done this so i'll give it my best shot one a common question that's come through from a, quite a few people from the uk is when do you know when to put the super on and when's a good time to start their flow hives okay so a good time to put the super on is when the brood box which is the bottom box here is nice and full you want to have lots of bees in the brood box they've gotten in there they've laid their babies you want it to look like that when you open the lid lots of bees the bees have been the queen's been laying her eggs in the cells the brood's been been uh, turning into grubs into and then emerging as young fluffy baby bees and then they will continue to grow and fill all the frames like that with nice wax and honeycomb and uh, you'll find there'll be there'll be um, brood in the middle and usually honey out towards the edges when you see that they've drawn all of the frames they're working all of the frames that's the time to put the super on so um, if you put it on a bit early no big deal if it's in a cold climate you can take that box off again if it's in a warm climate you could just leave it on and be patient as the bees grow and move up into the flow super. Great. Um, Diane wants to know, she lives in Montebello, California and has been thinking of starting a flow hive. How much space do I need um, to start with one box? Okay, that's a great question. And it's one that a lot of people consider as they get started in beekeeping. And the answer is people keep bees everywhere from balconies in Berlin to rooftops in New York to, to urban backyards to out on farms. And it's more about just thinking about where your, your bees are going and whether they're going to bother your neighbours. Jars of honey go a long way if you do find that you're in very close proximity to your neighbour and perhaps some bees are going and buzzing around their light at night or something. If they're sharing in the beautiful spoils that bees bring in, generally people are happy about seeing the, the bees around. And um, let's say even in springtime, if your hive swarms, the swarm could go over the neighbour's fence and you might then need to go and catch it. It's a good time to talk about bees the universe and everything and bring them some honey and hopefully you can keep 
your neighbour's suite if you are in a real urban environment. So you don't need a lot of space and that's a wonderful thing from a very small footprint. You can get an amazing amount of real produce in the city. People are harvesting amazing honey because people plant flowers all throughout the city and it's a really long season for the bees. They can go and get flowers whenever they like and your bees stay happy and healthy. Whereas in the more natural environments, bees, there, there tends to be more of a season. So while that's wonderful as well, there tends to be longer periods without flowers. So your bees will need to survive on the stores they have through those times. I've also noticed really diverse honey flavors from city areas. Certainly, you get the beautiful honey flavours in the city. People plant all sorts of things. The bees will go and get those flowers and you'll, you'll often get more variety than you do in, the, say, cropping lands where you've got big crops of similar things. One thing with the flow hive is you get to taste all those different flavours because the bees will tend to fill up, say, their centre frames and then move out to the outside ones, add more and more flowers and keep keep uh, storing that nectar and creating that honey so you'll get a completely different flavor from this frame to this frame and that's really exciting to me different colors different flavors of honey and you can even see that in these jars you've got a lighter one and a darker one here the range is from black that you can't even see through it right to almost clear honey and the flavors to match all of those different colors it's a um, beautiful thing to be able to experience that. Keep the questions coming in. We've got time for a few more. Oh, beauty. Got a couple of goodies here. A few people asking seeds about moisture in the super. And also, like, if you get that black mould in the super, or is there any maintenance that people should be doing on their supers? Okay. If you're seeing a bit of moisture, in the super that is normal from time to time depending on what's going on if you've if you've got a humid time a rainy time but the temperature is dropping what happens is the humid air can't hold as much moisture when it cools down so so cooler air can't hold as much moisture as warm air so if it was humid then it drops down the, you'll find that you'll open the window and you'll get a bit of moisture forming on the inside of the clear window here. Now, bees do rely on, if, if they're hibernating for the winter, for instance, they can rely on that moisture as a water source. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And um, sometimes it's just the case that you have windows so you can notice that there's moisture forming on the inside of the hive. If you're getting a lot of moisture, it's really kind of wet, then you might need to work on making sure your hive is nicely sealed under the roof. Perhaps there's some water getting into your hive. Um, another thing you could try is a little more ventilation in the bottom by either turning this around so the vents are on top, so there's airflow, or you could perhaps take this, the tray out altogether, allowing maximum ventilation and that might clear up some excessive moisture. But it's usually a product of the conditions um, and the, the weather patterns. Fantastic. Um, seeds, um, just Renata would love to know what's your favourite flavour of honey? Ah, uh, favourite flavour of honey. I do have many favourites and more than a, a having a single favourite, the thing I like to do is taste all the different flavours and to be able to share that with friends and family when they come. It's a wonderful thing to be able to compare one flavor to another flavor and share that experience. It really is a joy. So my favorite thing is lots of flavors rather than one single flavor. But if I had to, to pick a flavor of honey, the local iron bark here is one of my favorites. It's got bright floral notes. It's got that Australian eucalypt flavor and um, it really is a joy to eat that. But there's also other ones that come in. There's a butterscotch kind of flavor that is absolutely beautiful. It's one, it, it's a fav probably the all time favorite of my sister. She's totally obsessed with bees. That butterscotch flavor when it comes in, haven't worked out where it comes from. There are as many flowers in the world as there, <laughs> the, 
that there's as many flavours in the world as there are flowers that produce nectar. So it can be hard to pin down, but you also it becomes quite obvious sometimes when you can smell the flowers and link that to the beautiful flavour and aroma that comes out of your hive as they're, they're um, fanning their honey and nectar and drying it out. And then when you get to eventually taste that, there are quite a lot we can pick by even seeing the colour of it coming in as to what flower they're going after. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to, to um, then start connecting, oh, that tree's flowering and I'm seeing the nectar here, and you go and smell that flower, and you go and go and um, taste this honey, and you start joining the dots and learning more and more. I'm learning more and more all the time, and it's a, a real joy to be able to do that. Time for a couple more questions. Yep, great. A um, few people asking too about supers, and can you stack them more than one high? You certainly can stack supers more than one high. It, conventionally, you'll see even really tall stacks of supers. You hear of, of uh, people in, especially in the, uh, the North American parts where it's colder and perhaps people might stack their, their hives 10 supers high and then be harvesting honey in the conventional way with a step ladder, climbing up there, taking the boxes off, honey dripping all over their head as they then take those boxes off and pack them down for the winter time. Now, with the flow hive, you don't need to store so much honey on the hive. You can simply harvest it as you go and your bees will keep replenishing those stores in your flow frames if the flowers are there and your colony is nice and strong. So a different strategy is to run a smaller hive and, and uh, basically harvest the honey and allow space. So you're storing honey in jars on the shelf instead of many boxes in the bee yard. So that's a bit of a savings of equipment and also you've got to store all that equipment and you've got to make sure that the vermin doesn't get into all of those frames when you take them off. So it's a wonderful thing to be able to just have one or two supers and be harvesting honey from that. I tend to like to keep my hives a bit smaller and when, when the bees really breed up and start spilling out the entrance and, and really crowded when you look in these windows, it's a good time to take a split. If you don't want to, to expand your apiary and have another hive, then somebody else will love to have your, the split that you've taken from your hive. So I tend to just do one brood box, one super. However, many people, especially in the colder regions, like to go for, for perhaps two brood boxes and one super or one brood box and two supers. It's up to you. Ask around. From the conventional beekeeping fraternity, you will um, get the concept that you need more boxes. The flow hive allows you to run in a leaner way with less boxes and to be able to continually harvest honey and store your honey on the shelf instead of in the hive. Great question. Fantastic. And Mike wants to know, he wants to set up his beehive sort of towards his back fence and there's a couple of gaps in the slotted fence. Do you think the bees will be able to, will they fly through the fence or will they come over the fence? What do you think? Okay, if the fence is a little ways away from the entrance, let's say, you know, within a, within a metre or a yard, then you'll find the bees will probably fly out of the entrance and double back. The bees will do that fine. It'll just mean that if you're standing here, the flight path will end up being past your head, which I don't find a problem, but some people might prefer to have the flight path up and away so they're not kind of accidentally running into your hair sometimes and all of that. So a slotted fence, depend, it will depend on the width of the slots. Bees can fly through things, but a typical fence with small gaps like that, they're probably more likely to choose uh, a less obstructed flight path unless you're bang up against it. If you're right up against the area, perhaps they'll even just walk to the fence and then fly through the gaps. You'll have to experiment a little bit, watch your bees, see how they behave, and then you might need to pull the hive back a little bit further or just uh, turn it to the side a little bit so the bees can um, get a nice flight path out and away. Perfect. Time for one more question. One more. 
Um, okay, Mary Ann wants to know, um, she's put the super on and just wondering when should she, does she need to inspect her brood box? Okay, great question. So there's a lot of people starting out in beekeeping at the moment, especially in our northern hemisphere where it's springtime and people are really getting their hives ready, putting their bees in their boxes and getting started. So as to how often you'll need to get in here, get in your bee suit and pull out these frames and have a look, depends a little bit on your location. So here in Australia, the the it's much much uh, less demanding because we don't have the varroa mite. Now the varroa mite is uh, a little tiny red mite that gets onto the bees and if they breed up too much and there's too many in your hive it can really weaken your colony. So that will be a reason why you need to get in there and um, check on how your bees are going. More often in the summertime in uh, in those areas where you have the varroa mite so you need to make sure the levels are low so the bees can get about their business and store their honey um, here in australia the the way that people tend to do it is they will schedule in at least a few routine brood inspections to check for pests and disease by pulling out these frames um, uh, say three times a year. If you see the numbers dropping, you see something amiss, that's another time when you need to get into your hive, pull out the frames and have a look and see what's going on. We've got lots of videos showing you how to do that and we also have the beekeeper.org which is a new initiative was set up which is a, a um, online course to take you from a beginner right through to having quite expert knowledge and we've got many experts of the world contributing to that so that you get the, the best information. Because here, for instance, we don't have the varroa mite, so there's lots of great information coming in for the things you might find in your area and, and what um, uh, you'll need to do in your area. So the best information is going to come from your local beekeepers as to how often you'll need to expect and what pests and disease you might need to look out for. Thank you very much for tuning in. Tune in again same time next week. Put in the comments below what you'd like us to cover and hopefully we can answer all your questions so you can um, get on and have a great time beekeeping and enjoy harvesting honey after you've been looking after your bees and it's just such a wonderful thing to have that